much of the uh, things I had looked at, it looks like uh, Sister Maricini already covered that in the children's story. Uh, so to look at the children's story when it's time for her to do it, the uh, kids seem a little more excited uh, than everybody else. So I don't know how much they are, uh, uh, are still recollecting the, the, um, the generosity uh, that, was, that was bestowed, but they, are, they, they run down on the beeline uh, when it's time for you to do the children's story. But it's, I've always en enjoyed it and still do. Uh, this this uh, month, we, of course, are celebrating Black History Month. And so I wanted to, um, to talk about, about some things there with, uh, with black history, and of course, uh, that, that will be applicable and certainly, I think, lessons that, that we all could learn from. And I hope to, in the coming weeks, to talk of, of people of color in the Bible and, and who they are and so forth. Now, there are, are, you know, two extremes. And there's one extreme that people look at, and they, everybody in the Bible is white. And that's, uh, we know that's not the case. Uh, then there's another extreme that we look at, and um, everybody in the Bible is black. And we know that's not the case either. So we'll look at, at the, uh, the, his, the historical figures uh, that are there and, and who they are, uh, the ones that, that are, are prominently uh, featured in Scripture, and of course then for us. And so we talk about uh, Black History Month, and we celebrate that and remember that in February. So we wanted to have uh, some of the songs really designed for that. So thus, thus we sung... 305, a Negro spiritual, give me Jesus, uh, so that uh, just to, to uh, contemplate and remember of, of those, those songs and the meaning behind it. The experience of uh, blacks in America is uh, one that is, is fraught uh, with a very uh, disavory past. It was the institution of slavery that brought uh, the, the hordes of blacks uh, from Africa here. Uh, now, there were some that came uh, for, on the first ship over in, in terms of indentured servants, etc. And so shortly thereafter, of course, we're able to gain independence. But by and large, the influx of blacks that came to America came from the institution and by the institution of slavery. That was a lot different from slavery in any other time period in history uh, of the world. Uh, this is in, when you read in the Bible and you see of, of slaves being spoken of as not slavery as, as we know as American slavery was. But rather slavery there was talking about indentured servants. And so after a period of time of servant paying back the debt, the person was able to be freed. And so uh, in that, when you start reading an exodus of the treatment of the slaves, there was always to be equality. There was uh, to treat them with love. And so again, this was not owning someone. But rather this was a person paying off a debt. And I want to uh, be clear that there is a, a big distinction between it. So American slavery was that you own someone as you own property. And so with that property, you could do whatever you wanted to with it. And when the Bible speaks of, of slavery in the, in the sense of, of Israel, we're talking of, of indentured servants, of, meaning you owe me $5,000, you owe me $500, you owe me $50. You can't pay it off. You don't have the means, um, the wherewithal, the capital to pay it off. So you can go, go and work. And after you work, then would, of course, balance out. And once you've rendered $50 worth of service, the debt is paid, then you are henceforth uh, no longer under obligation to me. Uh, the system of American slavery, of course, was entirely different. It was one that was set upon uh, primarily by greed uh, and selfishness and cruelty. And to uh, keep slavery, to, to continue to feed it, of course, I uh, don't want to get into all the, the dynamics of it, of the slave trade back in between uh, America and the role England played and, and Africa and so forth, but I do want to dispel a few uh, myths. And so some of the myths that sometimes people say, well, um, blacks were selling each other into slavery. And so it was no big deal uh, to be able to come uh, here. Well, again, uh, bear in mind how they were treated. Slavery in the context of what would, uh, took place in the continent of Africa, whether a tribe conquered another tribe and so forth. And you've always had the history of, of people killing each other, etc. But it was nothing in terms of, of, of American slavery, of persons being beaten uh, because they did not work or refused to work. Persons being uh, lynched, etc. So those were not institutions there. Secondly, don't let people uh, trick you into thinking that, well, slavery was a better way for... Uh, these heathens that were in Africa. And one of the things that was used uh, to be able to placate uh, this was to say that they were taking slaves 
that were heathen, worshiping uh, idols and, and, and images and were involved in voodoo, and that they came here and they learned about Christianity. And so therefore, uh, it, it's good. And so uh, for those who would submit that uh, to that, that they would say, well, that, that is good, uh, then again, I would say, then you don't under, uh, understand a history, nor do you understand people, uh, nor do you understand the dynamics of Scripture. God is able to take any situation that is, that is bad and bring good out of it. But it is not his intention uh, to create bad situations. So if I go and st steal your car and it causes you to pray, uh, then the, the end result that you were able to pray and you're able to communicate and talk to God, that's a good thing. Uh, but you want your car back. Is it not, not the case? Uh, so uh, in Africa... Uh, Africa was not a, a continent of quote-unquote um, savages and heathens and people who didn't know about God. The, one of the strongest bastions of Christianity is the continent. And we talk about Africa. Uh, Africa is a continent. Okay? It's not, not a country. It's a continent. So just kind of a couple things in terms of that. So it's the same as you say America or North America um, or Europe, we're talking of a continent. The continent Africa is a continent. The various countries uh, are there. And so the, the slave trade primarily took place upon the Ivory Coast. Uh, but when you look at the history of Africa, there is the, it is replete with uh, the history of Christianity. In the book Great Controversy and other books that you read of when the European church, okay, uh, when the church went into apostasy, and Sunday became to be brought about as a day of worship and so forth, uh, that did not impact the churches that were in, in Africa. Uh, so you can read this again in Great Controversy. Uh, there she says that, uh, that the, uh, the, the apostasy that took place in Europe essentially did not impact the churches there. There had been as long the separation between the two. And so uh, Christianity, of course, was carried there. Uh, and you can look back in the, the context of uh, the Queen of Sheba. And she made her journey there. Uh, and was able to, again, to share. And the knowledge of God was, uh, was spread abroad. Even you look at the, uh, the, the impact that the, the South, uh, the motherland, played uh, in the propagation of Christianity. So it was there for the 1260 years that the knowledge of the Sabbath, uh, with the Waldenses and others, but these churches in Africa, um, they did not yield to the papal powers. So they did not embrace Sunday. And so when you read that in Great Controversy, then it begins to, um, to shed light um, that, again, we're not talking about nations of, of savages and heathens. And so uh, did you have some of that that existed? Yes, you did. Uh, but you also had uh, a great influx of Christianity there. And so the knowledge of God had been uh, preserved, had been uh, there. And so there were many people who worshiped God. So uh, to bring them from there, uh, here, under the, the auspices of slavery, and then therefore to say, well, uh, that's fine because they learned of God is to, to discount the atrocity that took place. Now, because many of these knew of God um, before they came here. Okay, so it's not a, uh, so don't let people give you a distorted view of history that, okay, these were just savage people running around uh, naked and they didn't have on clothing and they were, you know, climbing up trees and so forth. This, uh, that, that, that's uh, the whitewashing of history. Okay, uh, hi history uh, lets you know then that, that um, blacks were wearing clothing. We weren't walking around naked. You know, so you've seen too many uh, Tarzan uh, episodes and so forth think, well, this is how, uh, no. That, that is, that's not the case. It's not what history is. Okay? Uh, you look at the, the building of the, the pyramids. Scientists today still debate as to even how the pyramids were built. Uh, the ingenuity that was there. Uh, and, and to do that, um, then you're not talking about some basic level of math. You're talking about calculus and uh, these higher levels of math being able to construct this. So this is a, a continent that was full of, of inventors, uh, people who were wise and sharp, and, and uh, they're called grids that were able to contain uh, knowledge. And so you have an oral traditions in some countries where you have this information that is uh, communicated and passed on, but, uh, but you have grids and that they, they knew all this information, this history and so forth. And they said that when a grid died, it was worse than losing a library. Because they had all this knowledge that was uh, contained in their mind that they would just share from generation to generation, just like a walking encyclopedia. Uh, so, so it was a continent that was full of, and a continent also that's full of wealth. 
that is there. Now, some people say, well, the reason why, uh, again, that it is uh, poor, because it's the, the, the one continent uh, that has immense natural resources. Gold, diamonds, oil, gas, uh, the list goes on and on. There. And then people say, well, because it, they don't, uh, the reason why is because God has cursed them. And so that is also uh, another myth that is there. Uh, God did not curse blacks. Uh, that, that is a distorted view from, uh, from Genesis when uh, Noah was seen naked by his sons. And so it was no, no curse that befell um, blacks. So another myth that is there. Also, I'll be clear then, the Bible does not condone um, slavery. And so those in use the New Testament where Paul would say, uh, slaves obey your masters. Uh, they would use that to keep blacks uh, held into slavery. And yet, uh, they don't read uh, the passages uh, that therein follow uh, are the rest of St. Paul's writings. So as we talk about Black History Month, then it's important to remember the past. And so uh, we, we look at the past and we know that, the, that God has had his hands upon uh, all of his children, but particularly the, the blacks um, he's had his hands upon. No other way could a race have endured so much that it did unless God was with that race. And so blacks began to take encouragement from reading, and there's a parallel to the experience of blacks in this country, uh, from looking at the history of the Israelites when they were in Egypt. And so, and, you, and of course, I know you look at uh, the movies and so forth, and you think the people in Egypt were, um, were white, but uh, no, they were black. Okay, uh, th there were some Hicksaws that came in and that ruled for a period, uh, but, but they were, were black folks. Okay, so there's a whole continent of, of black. In fact, when I went over some, uh, some years ago, uh, you know, they had uh, houses just like you have, uh, they driving BMWs, and, you know, so you, you see, see some of the pictures that, uh, and I'm not saying there's not starvation, I'm saying there's not trouble and problems. But the image that you see, uh, oftentimes you think of Africa, think of just, you know, a bunch of uh, wild animals and people who are hungry and half naked. That, that's not the case, brothers and sisters, that's not, that's not the case. Uh, okay, uh, very educated um, people who are, are, are there. But we look at, though, at, at the impact of it in America and the legacy. So there's a legacy that is there because for hundreds of years, um, as the slave trade took place in, in the North, uh, we understand that, that, that a war took place between the North and the South, but the irony of it was that the South, uh, they used slave, this cheap labor, to be able to farm their fields, uh, to get taken care of the, of the cotton. Uh, with the, uh, the cotton gin, it created an insatiable desire for cotton. And to be able to get the cotton, uh, then the slave owners needed to have more slaves. Um, but where was the cotton processed? Was it in the south or was it in the north? Well, I'll give you um, a hint. It was in the north. Uh, there's where the, uh, the industries were. That's where you had uh, the factories to be able to take it. So you essentially had a system that the South had the slaves, and they used the slaves uh, for free labor to produce the cotton, but they couldn't do anything with the cotton. They had to, to ship it up north so that the northern, northerners would be able to process it. So essentially what I am saying is that the North was just as responsible uh, for the institution of slavery as was the South. The South had the slaves, but the North profited from slavery. So you start looking at the chastisement of God uh, upon the nation um, because of the North, their, uh, their con countenance of slavery in the South actually carrying it out. Okay? Uh, so uh, he, he was uh, going to punish the nation. Ultimately, we know that the, the nation was involved in civil war, uh, but during and after this time period, the, the blacks were not allowed to, to read. And so really where I'm going with this, just a quick overview of some of the history, uh, but also some of the implications today. Uh, because we are now over 130 years, actually 150 some years, uh, since the Emancipation Proclamation. And so, by the way, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. So, no, that, you can check it out. Uh, that was only in the, what area?
Oh, so it was, uh, essentially, uh, that was a move to be able to, uh, to help uh, to further the war. Okay, uh, it, that, that was done. So this is not uh, the, what freed the slaves ultimately was the collapse of the Confederacy. Okay, but the Emancipation Proclamation was important because it said that those slaves um, that were then in states uh, that were essentially going to be by the Union, they were now able to be free, but did not speak to the, the issue that was there. Okay, so it, it helped. I don't want to minimize it was there. Uh, another thing, of course, is uh, don't, don't think as well when you hear history that uh, Abraham Lincoln was in favor of freeing the slaves. No, he was not initially. Okay, uh, his whole thing was, uh, was that he didn't want slavery to extend, but he wasn't prepared to bring it to an end. But as the war continued to, to go on, uh, then he, he changed. Uh, his emphasis was, what can it take to preserve the Union? And as time went on, um, then that began to change. Okay? Uh, and when it was all said and done, though, when it was all said and done, you had um, blacks that have been now freed and liberated, but not having the ability to be able to go out and to work, provide, and to take care of themselves. And so uh, that's where I wanted um, to jump in today. And of course, the impact that it has for us, because we are still impacted um, by uh, slavery, though it took place um, a couple hundred years ago. Because you think of it, all the, the, the wealth, think of all the wealth that was generated in that time period. If you, if you could go to your job and you could have people work for free for you there, how much money could you accumulate? No. All you had to pay them and give them some, you know, the scraps, okay? So, uh, you, you know, you, you're not, I'm not talking about eating a really good meal, but I can just give you some scraps, uh, some clothes from time to time, uh, and, and I don't have to pay anything. How easy would it be able to accumulate and to build up? So slaves were kept in darkness. They were not allowed to, uh, to read. It was against the law uh, to teach people, to teach slaves how to read. This is in the 1833, the Alabama Slave Code states, any person who shall attempt to teach any free person of, of color or slave to spell, read, or write shall upon conviction thereof by indictment be fined in a sum of not less than $250 nor more than $500. And this is 1833. Uh, so that, that's, you know, I'm talking about um, a lot of money. In 1833, $250 to $500. So it was illegal to be able to teach people how to read, how to spell, and how to write. If you can keep a person in ignorance of not being able to read, spell, or write, then you can and definitely keep that person in ignorance uh, and subjug subjugation uh, for a lifetime. So it's feared and thought that if we would allow blacks to be able to know how to read, um, then they will want freedom. If they're able to read and understand their plight, then they will want something else. So if we can keep them in darkness, then they won't desire something else. Now, uh, if you go in your Bibles uh, to Psalms, the 78th division, Psalms, the 78th division, and beginning in the uh, fourth verse, Psalms, the 78th division, and beginning in the fourth verse, uh, God wants his people to be educated. He wants us to be literate. And there may be some reasons or issues that may have kept people from being literate, from being able to understand and to read. But, but the more a person is able to read, then the, the quest that is there to be able to understand knowledge, to be able to understand, well, what does God want from me? Uh, but we look in America and we see then that there is a, a system uh, that unfortunately has not directly benefited blacks. And so uh, not suggesting, and I want to be crystal clear here, uh, that that the uh, system that is existing in America is racist, okay? Um, but I will let you know that there are some racist people who will take advantage of the system. So what I want you also to understand is that you need to then know, well, what are the tools that I need to do and understand in the system um, that is established and that is set up, okay? Uh, so there, there are plenty of times uh, that, that you look at uh, what takes place in the news and you see it, and, and I would think that your heart would rend uh, over some of the atrocities that take place. But understand and know then that there are certain images that are, that are conveyed. Uh, there are certain stereotypes that are, are portrayed, that are put out. And uh, as Christians, then we certainly ought to do our part to be able to, uh, to combat that. But we also ought to have a knowledge in terms of what is taking place that is there. And so on the most feared persons uh, on, on earth, particularly in America, of course, is, is uh, a black man. Okay, so uh, then there's certain things that you ought to be able to know and to do. I remember when I was call portering, we would go door to door. That's how you had the call porter. 
And I remember the guy uh, one, that was leading us, he said, listen, you know, uh, you're tall and black. And he didn't mean anything to be disrespectful or disparaging, but he said, you're tall and black. So when you go to the door, then you have to, to bend down some. So you don't look so intimidating, uh, you know, to, to people. Because, you know, most people you're going to come across, they're going to be white. Okay? And, and they're going to be uh, many times ladies. So you have to, you know, you have to go down and, and kind of like lower yourself, just duck your knees down or bend them in a little bit so you wouldn't be as tall uh, as you were. Now, I never had any issues. I never had any problems and so forth. So I want to also be uh, clear in that respect. But there's a, a bit of, of knowledge that was there. So you had to know uh, who am I working with and what is the situation that is there. Now, the Bible says in Psalms, the 70th division and the third and fourth verse, it says, uh, speaking of, of the knowledge that God would impart, it says, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us we will not hide them from their children. Show unto the generation to come the praises of who? Of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works. When we read of the experience in the history of Israel, how many times do we read that God told them to repeat these things to your children and to their children? And when they came out of, of Egypt the, the, with signs and wonders, the fact that these stories were to be told and to be retold over and over again. Because it, it's, a, it's an easy for the next generation to remember, but for future generations to tend to forget. And so, in fact, when uh, the children of Israel crossed uh, the, the, the Jordan, uh, they were told to take out stones and to set them on the outside as pillars and memor as a memorial. So that whenever people would come by, they would be able to say, hey, what's this network of stones set up? And then somebody would tell them, oh, well, don't you know that this came from this? So my parents, uh, when uh, the Martin Luther King special would come on, uh, my mom would come and, and, and get my brother and I. And we'd have to go and sit down and watch. I'm like, you know, why would I watch this again? Every year, it seems though, come on, we had to go and we had to sit down and we had to watch it. Uh, because she wanted us to be able to know, wanted us to be able to understand. Now, if I asked uh, today, um, you know, the kids, like, who, who's Emmett Till? Who's Meg Gravers? Who's Toussaint Louverture? Like, uh, don't know who that is. Uh, you know, who's John Brown? The, like, you know, who, who, I don't know who that is. So, history must be repeated. It must be understood not to, to instill in the notion that, okay, well, well uh, whites are evil. Because, no, you must understand even in slavery, there were some very good white people who put their lives on the line to help blacks who looked and said, this is evil, this is wrong, this is unjust. And some were killed because of that. Okay, so then they, they lost their possessions because of it, because they said, this, what we see is not right. Uh, you, you know, you think of John Brown and Harper's Ferry, and uh, what he did, he said, we, you know, we, we need to have a revolution. And so I'm not advocating for you to go into, to, to get guns and to seek to, to do something violent, but he felt that, okay, well, violence um, that is being met, it must be met back by, by violence and so forth. And he didn't mean it in the sense just go into, uh, to kill indiscriminately, but he was saying, well, uh, this is what is taking place and we can only deal with it in this respect. But if we don't have a history or a knowledge of those things and where we come from, then we won't know where we're going. So, yes, we're going toward the kingdom of God. But until we get to the kingdom of God, then we also have to have a knowledge of the affairs that take place. Jesus said, uh, you are being in the world, but not of the world. And so there are certain stereotypes that are there um, that must then be dealt with and understood. So how can we then live in a country that today, that you know that more than 30 million adults cannot read, write, or do basic math above a third grade level? Talking about it in, in America. 30 million adults cannot read, write, or do basic math above a third grade level. And this is not to make anybody embarrassed or to put anybody down, um, but why is that? So the, the mindset behind it and the, uh, the, the notion that is there. You see, if we can't read, write, and do basic things, uh, then you won't be able to quote unquote uh, to understand and to get an education. If you can't get an education, uh, then you will be, uh, historically speaking, uh, you will only be able to get 
um, the jobs that people don't necessarily want. Now, now, let me also be clear. All work, A-L-L, all work is honorable. Okay? All work is honorable. It, it could be, one of my first jobs was, uh, I was a uh, custodian, a janitor, you know. And, and so, did you want, necessarily want your classmates to see you going in? Uh, no, no, you know, I mean like any 14, 15 year old, but, but I'll tell you what, uh, when I had, you know, uh, some greens in my, my pocket, that felt really good. Uh, you know, when they came in the store, I, you know, I, I didn't mind it because I had some money in my pocket. I was, you know, uh, so I had a pocket full of money. So I was totally uh, fine with that. All work is good work, you know, if it's, if it's noble. And you do it to the glory of God, not, not being ashamed of it. Do it to God's glory. And guess what? If you're faithful in the discharge of small duties, whatever it is, then God will open up the door for something else. But historically, though, and even uh, to the day, if you don't have an education, then, of course, it will mean uh, if you drop out of high school, and there are people who say, you know, I don't need to, well, I need to go to high school. I'll be the next Bill Gates and so forth. And it, it amazes me how people look. Uh, you know, you can find some people who didn't go to college, and they've done extremely well for themselves. You know, Bill Gates, didn't have a, he doesn't have a college degree. Uh, Steve Jobs didn't have a college degree. Now, a lot of these guys, they dropped out of college, okay? Um, they didn't pursue in the, um, that. But for every Bill Gates that you can point to, for every... Uh, Steve Jobs you could point to. There are like tens of thousands or 20,000 that, that don't have that same ending. You know, it's like the one that says, I'm going to go to, to Hollywood and become an actor. I'm going to become a, uh, a musician. And that's how I'm, and, and they're not interested in anything else. Uh, the person that says, okay, I'm going to go in to be, become a professional uh, uh, athlete. And so in, in the black community or colored communities, uh, you can be more than being an athlete. That, that seems to be like the, the uh, but we put that up sometimes, though, with that that is the sum total. And, and I'm not trying to put athletes down. But I'm saying that we, we, you know, we, we could be an athlete, but you can also do a lot of other things as well. And so they say, well, I don't need school because I'm just going to be an athlete. Uh, and I would hope that you know that the average, uh, average athlete that plays in the NBA is like a th three-year career. And I would also hope you that you know that the average football player is going to play about two and a half years. I hope you also be aware that in other sports that, um, that there's no longevity that is there. So it's only three years, two or three years is there. Now you look at these other people who may have played for 15 years, 20 years. Those are the exceptions. That's not the norm that is there. So if you have a, a poor education, you can say, well, I'm not going to read, I'm not going to learn. Some people say, well, I don't need to read. And so I would challenge you then uh, to, to, to read a book as often as you can every month. Now I'm saying outside the Bible. Okay, uh, so I want you to certainly read the Bible. I want you to read the Spirit of Prophecy. Um, but read, read something that will educate you, that will stimulate your mind, make you a better person, make you a better husband, make you a better wife, make you a better student. Something to be able to feed the mind, uh, to learn from it and to be able to grow um, therein. So with the inferior education, uh, then that means then that I will probably not be able to get a good paying, as good paying job as I want. Now, if I can't get as good paying job as I want, then that impacts me in a variety of different ways because my earning power is now greatly diminished. Because I, I'm not able to earn as much as I would like to earn, then that means then when it comes to things like health care, my health care is going to be inferior. Because I'm not going to be able to uh, afford to pay for the type of service that I would like to have. Not only will my health care be inferior, but... Uh, I probably won't be able to get as good quality of food as I would like to be able to get uh, because I can't afford to get the quality that I would like to get. And because then that, that is also impacted then, and then I may not be able to live in the area that I would like to live in. And if I can't live in the area that I would like to live in, and, and you know how uh, there's some school systems that are going to be better from one or the other. Now, I know that somebody would say, well, that's why we ought to all teach our own children and so forth and so on. And I, I would say to you that, um, that, that that sounds good and that's ideal. Uh, but that is not necessarily a reality. Okay, so th there's not a situation where, quote, unquote, and some people, I'll tell you, you shouldn't teach your, your, your kids. <laughs> uh, you know, if you, don't, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, don't, 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 don't mess your kids up. Okay, if you don't understand, and I know that some people say, well, God will uh, teach me, God will give me wisdom and so forth. Um, God helps those who, who help themselves, they say. 
Um, but we also ought to have the wisdom to be able to know and understand what's our limit and beyond our, our scope. Okay? So uh, you, you may mean well and want well, but if you don't have, uh, you, you know, if, if, if math isn't your, 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 your area, your strong suit, okay, I, I can't help you there. But if you're then in this, this situation then, and there's hope, so don't, don't, don't become discouraged. So if I can't get there to the right education then that I want, then it means then that by and large my, my, my uh, children may have, quote unquote, an inferior education. Okay? So, in, in, you know, that there's some schools that where they, the kids use uh, iPads. And you have some other schools that's around the corner, and they don't even know what an iPad is, right? And that, of course, comes down to a social economic issue that is there. So we don't have the technology there and the jobs in that are being turned out that are going to be most productive in terms of quote unquote uh, establishing oneself are going to be typically speaking some type of job that's going to deal with technology. I'm not saying become, um, don't misunderstand, right? But what I am saying is that, that I hope you can see now that there's a, a pattern that is being set up because if I'm getting an inferior education and I don't, don't understand technology and my counterparts are going to a school where they're using technology, they're able to understand it. When we get out of, out, of, out of high school, that person is in front of me simply because of their exposure, because of what they've used, what they're used to. Okay? So they've been prepared to go into a world that is based upon technology, whereas I haven't. So what does that mean? That means I'm coming out um, behind already. Now you add that to the fact then of, of schooling. Now uh, I'm not going to go through the numbers behind it, but you know then that essentially, uh, historically, uh, that the data suggests that the more uh, a person is able to go and to learn, um, then the better their earning opportunity is going to be. So then if I can't go to school, then that means then I won't be able to get then education. I won't be able to get uh, some of the things to live into um, an area I want. I will have inferior health um, and so forth. And so the cycle continues. The cycle then continues. So then well, how are we able then to, uh, to corral and to address uh, that. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 16. So if I can't get it, the cycle then continues. So uh, there must be an emphasis then. Uh, so we can't look to the government then to be able to, uh, to fix uh, the problems that exist. And there are problems that exist um, and we ought to be aware of those things. You want to go for a job interview, turn into Proverbs chapter 16, um, verse 16, and we must educate and share. The stereotype is uh, that, that, that blacks are lazy. The stereotype is that, that um, they'll steal. And this isn't every, I'm just dealing with, with blacks. So you look at the prison system today. Uh, how can you have a nation that, that blacks only account uh, for maybe 20 some percent of the population, but the prison population is predominantly black? Now, in recent years, those numbers have come down. Uh, but some suggest that the reason why they've come down uh, is because the, uh, the law, law enforcement is now turning to crimes that are more practiced by whites. So, for instance, in the 80s, crack cocaine was a huge e epidemic, impacting mostly black communities. Why? Because whites, they, didn't, they were buying coke. Okay? Um, crack cocaine was, you know, it was a cheaper form. And so blacks were buying that, and so the enforcement was really to go after those who were using this. And so in recent years, of course, uh, there's been a, uh, definitely a change in terms of, of laws, etc. And some of them now are designed to go after um, child predators. And when you look statistically at child predators, um, usually white people. Uh, so therefore now you have more whites who are being, uh, you know, evicted, uh, or not evicted, convicted. Uh, so that is keeping, and so then some of the drug enforcement and so forth is changing. Now, you know, marijuana is now, uh, in most states, is legal. Okay? So uh, before it was illegal. And so, you, you know, you don't have a bunch of money, uh, but you can get you a little dime bag. And so you get caught with that, you're going to be in jail. But because now it's not, in, it's not a felony as such, uh, now we can start seeing that those numbers have, have changed uh, some in that respect. Okay? Um, but we have then uh, still tons of people who are in prison. And when you're in prison, uh, it makes it much harder when you come back out to be, quote unquote, rehabilitated. Because who's going to give a convicted felon a chance? 
There's some places that will, but many that will not, and it makes it hard. And so then you saying, well, I'm trying to, to, to provide, I'm trying to get back out, but no one is willing to allow me to be able to amend for what I've done. I paid my debt to society, but I cannot seem to turn the corner. And if I don't have the means of being able to be able to earn uh, an honest income, then the temptation is real that I'll go back into things that will be um, dishonorable. And so then the cycle continues. So we must then find a way to be able to, uh, to address uh, the cycle uh, and to be able to, to correct it that is there. As I was looking and preparing, uh, one thing that stood out, and this is, uh, was the impact that fathers play. Do you know that if a father is not in the home, there's a four times greater risk of poverty. That a father's not in the home, that, that there's a seven times more likelihood of teenage pregnancy. That if a father's not in the home, then children are two times more likely to drop out of high school. So again, that, this only mirrors then what we're talking about. So it's not a situation that people are saying, well, look, let's, let's oppress people and do that. We, sometimes people, you have the expression, you give a man a rope, Enough rope, he'll, he'll hang himself. Uh, so this is not about this people making us do stuff. This is some of the, 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 the stupid stuff we're doing. If the father's not in the home, uh, behavioral problems and substance abuse, the likelihood it increases. Now, Proverbs uh, tells us not to move kind of, I mean, I, Technically, I'm um, out, out of time. Um, Proverbs chapter 16 uh, and verse 16. So I'm, I'm going to take just maybe five minutes. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse uh, 16. It says, how much better is it to get what? Wisdom than, than gold. How much better is it to get wisdom than to get gold? It, it says. And to get understanding rather to be chosen than silver. So it's, it's better to have what? Wisdom than to have gold. Now, who, who would rather that? Would you rather have a book or some money? Would you, so, so this is what it is saying. It's saying just the opposite, though. It's better to have wisdom than to have money. Why? Because riches take flight. But knowledge is something that is able to be used and to be replicated. And so we use the expression again, of course, you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. You teach a man a fish, then he can eat for a, a lifetime. So give a man wisdom. And so we, then we, there's an impact that is there of being able to gain wisdom. Now, certainly the most important wisdom that we can, we can gain is the, the true wisdom and the knowledge of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Right, so, so let that be first and foremost, that, that the wisdom that God gives me I'm going to take that, that's going to be the foundation whereby everything else is built upon. But then I understand now that the wisdom that God has given me, that, that in the world that I live in, then, because Jesus said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, is that, that there are people that are going to have certain stereotypes. So I don't want you going up, uh, trying to get a job, and, and your pants all sagging down. And you go out to shake hands, uh, the man extends his hand, or the woman extends her hand, and you, you're going to dap them up. That, that's, that's not. And then you wonder, uh, why didn't they call me back? To put on a shirt and tie, a blouse, they look nice and professional, presentable. Uh, go, you say, well, you know, you got nose earrings and, uh, and so forth. Well, again, you, it is the, the, the framework that, that you deal with. I'm not saying, and people say, well, I'm not going to look like the white man. I'm not, I'm not asking you to look like the white man. I'm, I'm asking you to do is understand the framework of what is there. Uh, Paul said that I have become all things unto all men. And we use a different expression. Say when in Rome, there was the Romans. Okay? Uh, people are afraid of what they don't understand. They're intimidated by uh, what they don't understand and what may appear different. So if you want to dap, you can, you can, you know, you can dap later. Uh, but when you sit down and talk, you, you have to talk in a way that's going to be intelligent, intelligent uh, and understandable so that they can understand what, be, what is being communicated, what's being stated. Because they're looking, saying, not that a quote-unquote, per se, I'm going to 
discriminate. I don't want somebody black working for me. I don't want someone of color not working. And there are people who do that. Okay, I'm not, um, it's not some Pollyanna belief. But if I feed that stereotype of what they have, though, then they're just going to say, well, let me just uh, summarily dismiss this person. The, the, the wise man says that it's better to have wisdom than gold. Now, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 13. So wisdom is better than gold. There's a premium that is there. And I would submit to you then that, that your ancestors, they wanted to be able to, to have wisdom, to understand, to know. So now we have the freedom to be able to, to read books. Now we have the freedom to be able to go online, to be able to educate ourselves and to learn and to grow. And yet um, that, that freedom is not avail is not oftentimes taken advantage of. In Proverbs chapter 4, um, in verse 11, it says, I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. So we must teach people in the way of wisdom. We ourselves may have failed. We ourselves may not have been able to achieve things, but, but don't, uh, don't frustrate or hinder the dream of, of someone else. The, those that come behind you. Uh, you serve as, a, as a, uh, a guide, a, a guide to instruct them in terms of what God would have of them, and also to be able to proffer the destiny in which God has called every one of us. You know, the uh, Bible says in Proverbs, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 5, um, that be also therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And we read in the Spirit of Prophecy, it says, a higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Jeremiah 29, God says, I know the thoughts and the plans that I have towards you. To give you hope and an expected end. And so you begin to look at that and understand that as I lead the way before, then I have a responsibility to those that follow behind me. Not just to, to my children, but to any life I can be able to positively impact. Because here is society that would put this view that, that is there, um, that, that paints it. And so we don't want to have these broad strokes. We must go against the grain. Now, well, I, I want then for our children to be learned and to be taught of God. To understand that, that in the sight of God that they are of great value. That their life is, is, is precious in his sight and that he will use them to be able to achieve um, thoughts and dreams that maybe they don't even understand themselves. But there will be no shortcut. There will be no easy way. There's not going to be a, a, a free path where it's laid out. It's going to have to come by, by blood, sweat, and tears. And the Bible tells us in James 1 that God is the one that is the author of wisdom. He is the one that will supply it. According to James chapter 1 and verse 5, he is the one that gives to all men. Uh, so never forget him in the source and the conquest of being able to learn. But if you're able to learn then, then that means uh, I'm able to know, open up other doors. Is it too late to then be able to change uh, the past or the path where it's there? Then I would say to you that no, it is, that it's never too late to be able to change as long as uh, there, there is breath that is there, there's still the opportunity to be able to change. Uh, don't, don't be satisfied with, uh, with mediocrity. But strive for, for excellence. Push yourself above in, in the fear of God as to what you... Look at the men in, in the Bible. And I'll, I'll, I'll read James 1, 5 and uh, make these few uh, statements and be quiet. Look, look at Daniel. What was Daniel's job? We talk about him all the time. Uh, we talk about his prophecy. We're reading through him. Now, what was his job? It's like a prime minister. Now, now if you talk about that now in, in many Adventist circles, people say that's worldly. No. So, now, you know, don't, uh, don't, don't, don't be. Daniel was, was a prime minister. Well, what about Joseph? This is a high-ranking government official. And so I'm not saying uh, th th to do or don't do what I am simply saying is, is that God will elevate you into a, a status or whatever it happens to be. And so we use Daniel, he used Joseph, wherever these men were. And wherever you are in life, then if you're faithful unto God, God will use you as an ambassador. Don't take the talent that he's given you and waste it and to bury it. Don't, don't take the talent he's given you and to, to cast it aside and say, well, I'm going to settle for, uh, for this which is second best. No, use that talent. Let God develop it. Let it be cultivated. Let it be home that it may bring him honor and glory. For it says in James chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, if any of you lack wisdom, 
Let him ask of God, for he giveth to all men liberally. And he abradeth not, and it shall be giveth him, given him. Uh, God is the source of wisdom. So when you go to God, ask God to give you wisdom. And, and we read that by understanding the scriptures, it opens up the mind uh, to be able to grasp and understand just um, the basic things of life. Let God be the source of wisdom. Uh, let him be the one that is able to, uh, to speak into our minds and to our hearts and to give us an insatiable desire to be able uh, to learn and to grow. In Proverbs 22 and verse 6, the Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, so in closing, brothers and sisters, the, the privileges that have been afforded us are unique from the privileges that were afforded as we talk of Black History Month. Uh, those who were in front of us. Uh, we have a lot of opportunity that is there. And because we've been given much, much is required. So make it a point then that you would do your best then to be able to honor uh, and to set a legacy then by God's grace then that will be safe for those feet that follow behind uh, to be able to walk therein. And if you're in a situation where you look and say, well, I, I, I'm... It is hopeless, it is hopeless. No, uh, it, it is not hopeless. Some would say, well, uh, the statistics, they don't, they don't seem to be too favorable. Uh, well, you, you, you forget the fact that God will send people into your life that will be able to serve in that capacity. There, there are people who may not have, quote, unquote, biological relationships. And though those things may hurt, I want you to know that God will send, he will send if you ask him. He'll send that person into your life to be a blessing unto you. He'll send that woman into your life to be a woman of God. He'll send that man into your life to be a man of God, to be able to guide you. In the but, but if you don't ask him, but if you go and ask him, Lord, this is what I need right now for, for my development to be what you want me to be, then the Bible says then that no good gift uh, will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And so the odds may look hard, um, but when you know the game that is being uh, played, because the game will be played. But now that you know the, the rules of the game, uh, then you can go and you can play ball. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity of being able uh, to look in your word. We know that you've called us with a high destiny. Uh, we, we can settle for uh, mediocrity, but, but we, we come. Uh, from a line of people, men and women who uh, have done great things in the sight of God. And, and you've been with your people. And we thank you for being with us. We thank you for allowing us to be born at the time in which we were born. We thank you for allowing us to be in this church today. We thank you for allowing us to be a part of the families that we're a part of. And no family is perfect, Lord. We know that uh, that is for sure. Um, but we know that perfection resides in you. And we know that no matter what our situation may be, uh, that it is not bleak. It may look bleak. It may look uh, deplorable and miserable in our own eyes, but we look today with the lens of heaven. And where we may see uh, disaster, there is opportunity for you to be able to excel and to use the weak things of humanity to be able to show forth your grace, your strength, and your power. Pray you would bless us. Um, send men, godly men, send godly women into the lives of those who need those uh, persons uh, to be able to, to guide us aright. Help us to not make the mistakes that others have made, to be able to learn uh, and then uh, to help others so that they can do better as well. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you again for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.